Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to the Taipei Cooper um, and LeBallon um, Center's joint presentation of the uh, Herb LeBallon Lecture Series, um, part of the, the extended uh, program in typeface design. My name is Alexander. I'm one of the instructors in the program and welcome you all to, to this event and thanking you for joining us. Um, I wanted to first and foremost um, thank uh, Type Culture for their generosity in, in uh, allowing us to record uh, this, this presentation um, and allowing us to add to a growing archive of uh, type talks that we have um, in the collection. So thank you again to uh, Type Culture, which is an independent uh, digital type foundry and a wonderful academic resource owned by Mark Jammer. So check them out. Um, they're fantastic. And we're so glad that they're allowing us to continue to record and add to the collection of lectures. If you missed any of the talks, um, you can see them in um, our archive on online. Uh, we have two places where you could see these uh, past videos. Uh, in this uh, uh, fall uh, edition of the lecture series, we had uh, a talk with uh, um, Nick Sherman about Franklin Gothic. We had a talk by David Shields uh, discussing uh, Robert Kelly's work on uh, American wood type. And we had uh, Polina Gods talking about the um, uh, typographic education at the Futimas, the, the Soviet equivalent of Bauhaus. Uh, and we had a great um, conversation with Anna Bokov, the um, curator and author of the Futimas, the recent uh, book on Futimas. So there'll be an exhibition of Futimas um, here at Cooper Union in uh, uh, February of, um, January, sorry, of, of this year, January through February of this year. And of course, um, today's talk will be added to this this growing collection of, of, of material. If you missed any of the lectures, actually, I will um, post this link here. You can go to our YouTube um, feed. You can see the last three lectures. If, if they've not been added to the Vimeo archive, you can see them there. And also, you can um, uh, go directly to this link here if you wanted to quickly cycle through um, of about eight to nine years worth of lectures on there. So it's a fantastic, fantastic series. Um, without further ado, I'm going to um, introduce today's presenter, James Clough. Um, I'm very glad that we have James here with us again. Uh, it's always really, really interesting to hear um, his insight and his research. So I'm really looking forward to, to this talk as, as well as all the previous talks, which um, I just, uh, as I said, I posted the link, check out the other two talks by, uh, by James. Um, he, um, uh, they're, they're in the edition of the lectures, one from last year and the one uh, uh, from a, a year ago. So I'll introduce quickly um, James and, and then I'll let, I'll let James take over. Um, James Clough, um, following his training in typographic design at the London College of Printing, moved from London to Milan in 1971, uh, where he pursued a career in typography, lettering, and calligraphy. In 1981, he was founding member of the Associazione Calligrafica Italiana, and in 2016, he was the uh, convener of the International Conference in Milan on the Future of Handwriting. Um, you'll see how a lot of that plays into what he's going to be sharing with you today. For the past 30 years, he has uh, deepened his knowledge of the history of writing, type, and graphic arts, and has lectured on these subjects in Italy and many other European countries, as well as here in the United States. Besides his many articles and lectures on Giambattista Badoni, uh, James is, a, is the author of Alphabets of Wood, which is a history of Italian wood type and also the author of Signs of Italy, which is a fantastic book on, on uh, signage across uh, uh, Italy. Uh, from 2016 to 2019, the Italian newspaper La Repubblica published his Sunday column on the historical and modern Italian inscriptions um, and signs. And in 2021, he was uh, a presenter along with the, uh, the other members of the Nebbiola History Project, uh, gave a talk for this very lecture series on the microgramma and Eurostile typefaces. And then the following year, he gave a talk, a wonderful talk on uh, Giambattista Badoni. Um, currently, James is working on a book on monograms, uh, which we'll maybe kind of uh, touch on at the end of the talk, perhaps kind of talk about it for, for, for a little bit. But if, if anyone has interesting um, insight or interesting material on uh, 
monograms do reach out to James. So without further ado, I will turn it over to James and let him take over. Thank you so much for being here with us, James. Thank you. Uh, and uh, here we are. <clears throat> So here we are, and uh, it's very nice to be back here with the Cooper Union. And my thanks to Sasha and to Kara and to the Cooper Union for uh, allowing me this talk. Um, writing, history of writing, well, it's an enormous subject. It's, you know, I mean, just like type is an enormous subject. There's so much to say about it. Uh, I'm going to be talking about many different, well, several different styles, certainly not all of them. Uh, I'm interested in how letters were made, how the instruments that they were used to make them uh, maybe um, influence the shapes of the letter forms. Uh, I'm, in, I'm not a paleographer. Well, I could say perhaps I'm an amateur paleographer. I mean, paleography is a very interesting science. I'm going to touch on that um, in the first few slides. Um, we're going to go right from uh, Roman writing right up until um, digital times. Um, that sounds a bit awe-inspiring to perhaps some of you. Uh, it's an enormous amount, but I've been, you know, tried to be fairly stringent and not put, put in too much material so that we'll get things done in a sort of uh, even flow within a, a decent, um, decent amount of time. Um, <clears throat> I'll be talking just about the Latin script and not any other kind of script, of course. Uh, <clears throat> so I think we could start with the first slide and look at a piece of Roman writing. Well, that was that is not actually a photograph of the uh, actual piece where this writing is uh, is on. It was um, a wax tablet and survived in one way or another, the uh, eruption of Vesuvius in 79 BC, or AD, AD, not BC, excuse me, I made a mistake there. Um, and very difficult for us to understand. We can't read that, we just cannot read it at all. You might notice that there are only uh, diagonal and vertical strokes here. There are no curves, no curves, uh, and no horizontals, except perhaps very occasionally here. Well, why was that the case? Because it was difficult to use a stylus, probably a metal or a uh, wooden stylus, scratching the wax, uh, and it was difficult to make curves. It wasn't a natural movement for that kind of medium. Uh, anyway, let's see if we can understand this. Um, I've done a uh, I've done a transcription here, and you can see C, a big C. Another C, and that was an O, just two strokes. M, we can recognize that, and I, we can recognize that too. N, I, U, which of course the Roman U was the same as the Roman V, and then you've got a very big S, and then a P, no, no word break, no uh, uh, space between the words, and then we got Pyricus, that's a P, Y, two R's, I, C, H, U, S, and they've got an ampersand. Amazing. The ampersand goes back to Roman times. Isn't that amazing? I'll just do one or two more uh, words here. Uh, that's an L, novius, N O V I U S, uh, et priscius. That's a P R I S C U S, et, there's another ampersand, L campus, C A. M and a P I U S. I'll, we'll leave it at that for, for now because there's a little too much uh, to go through. Let's move on to something else. Um, here we've got another piece of Roman writing, a more a developed piece of Roman script here. This is, um, I mean, whereas we could call the previous one, the previous style, they are very rare, these wax tablets, very, very, very few of them. The one I showed before was from the Naples Museum of Archaeology. Um, these, this is done on papyrus uh, a few centuries later, uh, several, almost five centuries later. Uh, and you can see here 
how uh, the letters are changing. There are more letters that we can recognize. It's more of a cursive style. And we can also try to understand that better here. I've transcribed this. Domino, D-O-M-I-N-O. Suo, that's the long S, which looks like an F to us, but it's used in script and also in type later on. Achillio, A-C-H, look at that very complicated H there. I-L-L-I-O, Vitalis. And then you've got C U M in nomnibus N O M N I B U S bonus. The interesting thing with the B here is that it looks like a D. Uh, the the um, the counter is on the left instead of on the right. But we can, apart from that, we can recognize a few of these letters, and it is uh, a basis for the development, the future developments of, of probably the Ansel scripts. Well, here we have something that is uh, even, you know, around about that same time here on the left, we got a piece of parchment that was discovered somewhere in Egypt uh, at the end of the 19th century. And this dates back to the second century AD. Uh, it's in the British Museum. And, it's, and it, you can see here, there are several different styles of letters here. We can recognize perhaps a rustic, E here, uh, and we can recognize a minuscule D here with the uh, with the uh, stem slanted uh, diagonally. Uh, and you can also see a lot of contrast between the thick and the thin. That's because parchment was very smooth and working with a reed, a flat nibbed or flat pen, a flat reed pen, you could achieve that kind of contrast. Here, there's something rather different and a bit later, third century. Uh, also found in Egypt, I believe. Uh, oh, wait a minute, sorry, that should not be there. Uh, very bad photograph, I'll just pick this up on the internet. Um, I want to get rid of this piece here, but I don't know how to do that. Wait a minute, we'll put it down. There we are. Uh, a fragment of papyrus. Um, you can see here an A, which we can recognize quite clearly, uh, and a D with a vertical stroke. Uh, so here, I think, Looking at these two, we can see sort of um, uh, an anticipation of um, the of what was to come uh, in the uh, in the future centuries. Here we got rustic capitals. You can see here the pen held almost vertically uh, from uh, uh, Virgil, fifth century Virgil. But here we have something interesting. It is. I'm going to get rid of this if I can. Can I get rid of this bar here at the bottom? Well, I can't. Anyway, um, here we got Ansils, fairly quickly written Ansils uh, from the, oh, sorry, I didn't want that, from the, how do I get rid of this thing here? There, that's better. That's better. Sorry, you can't see what's going on on my screen. Okay, that's better now. I can see everything clearly. Ansils from the Book of SCL, 5th century. And these are fairly quickly written on parchment. You can see here, uh, the development of lowercase letters very clearly. Uh, that's a U, that's an E with a very tiny counter, and a D also, like we saw in the, pre what, the first previous slide, uh, with a diagonal, um, a diagonal stem there. The N remains the same, but the M is done uh, very similar to a, to a, um, a minuscule M. There you are, it's just a transitional stage between upper and lowercase or majuscules and minuscules would be more appropriate uh, expression in this case. Why did this happen? Well, they needed to write quickly, didn't they? Uh, they probably were inspired by what they saw of Roman of the Roman script to get there, but these are new, these are new letter forms. Um, and that is the whole history of writing really is based on the necessity to write clearly and at speed as well, quickly. I mean, if you're writing, a, if you're writing a um, uh, a Virgil or an Ezekiel in this case, or Saint Augustine, it's a it's heavy work, and the scribes had to do it fairly quickly. So they developed the uh, the minuscule letters that we know today. Uh, well, this is a very famous book that I'm sure many of you know, the Book of Kells uh, in Dublin, and here we can see. Uh, sort of semi ansels I think they're called. Uh, we can see letters. We can read this very easily, and it's a very, a very important book. And this is uh, is uh, very, um, very dearly cherished by the uh, by the Irish. 
nation. Uh, in fact, it has informed the Irish script. The Irish were dominated by uh, the uh, uh, English imperialists for a thousand years. I mean, they weren't even allowed to speak their own language at a certain period. They were massacred over the centuries by Cromwell and other uh, unpleasant characters. And so they had to define an identity. They did that hanging on to their religion, the Catholic religion, like the Poles did as well on the, on the, on the East. Uh, they, they would hang on to their, uh, to their Catholic religion uh, in the face of the Protestant aggression. And writing also became uh, uh, an expression of national identity. As we can see here, well, not really, because this is uh, not a real Irish pub. It's a fake Irish pub. It's an Italian Irish pub. Uh, and you can see there is a version of the Irish script. It's, uh, it happens to be linotype omnia, but it does get fairly close, I suppose, to, um, to the Irish, uh, Irish unseals. Uh, La Quercia. I actually, a few years ago, I went into that pub with an Irish friend of mine. We opened the door and he immediately understood. And he said, the only thing that's Irish in this pub is me. And he was quite right. <laughs> well, uh, you know, that is probably more um, authentic. It's an Irish paint shop um, in a small town. And in Irish, in Irish, Irish lettering in Irish, so that is very much more authentic and uh, has a lot of charm as well. Uh, well, let's move on to the uh, to the Carolingian script. Yeah, you know about um, how this happened, of course, around uh, the empire. The emperor uh, Charlemagne uh, was interested in um, spreading education throughout his empire. And he got hold of uh, the Archbishop of York, or a bishop, was it a bishop or an archbishop? I can't remember, but I remember Olguin, who, is an inst who instructed um, scribes in, um, in the scriptorium of Tours uh, in a new form of letters uh, of script that um, became uh, almost universal throughout the empire. Uh, and it was a huge success. Uh, and you know, this had also uh, a long career as, a de as developed um, into something rather different. You can see this R here, for example, that part on the right, the, which is sort of uh, a double curve on the right, that is really uh, an abbreviation of the, uh, of the majuscule R, of what you see on a majuscule, which has the curve on the top and a straight, uh, and a straight tail um, or diagonal tail reaching the uh, baseline. Well, you know, that is an abbreviation of that. Whereas here you can see, we can recognize every letter in this and, it's, uh, and it did become universal. Notice also, well, this is, uh, there's a lot of space between the lines written on parchment uh, and we can recognize every single letter here very easily. They of course used unseals uh, for their capital letters within the text. Um, Interesting to see that the humanistic strip, well, during the 15th centuries, uh, during the 15th century in Italy, the humanists in Florence uh, um, uh, decided that they wanted, they were dead keen on find, discovering the old Latin texts that people had forgotten. You know, I mean, people may have known about Virgil, but perhaps not Terentio, uh, Terentius. Uh, and so they scouted books in the monasteries all over Europe and um, paid for them and brought them back to Florence and they instructed their, uh, their um, uh, writers, their copyists, to copy not only the text but also the style of writing. Of course the style of writing was a sort of later version of the Carolingian script. But the interesting thing that I think we can understand looking at this is that uh, each writer, each copyist had his own style. Uh, and that was because there are lots of curves here. Of course, the, one of the basic features of the minuscules is that there are curves. There are far less curves in the uppercase, uh, in the uppercase letters of the Roman script, of the Roman, um, of the Roman inscriptional script. Uh, and so curves are rather more difficult to handle and a personality emerges from each, uh, each writer, as we can see in this case. Of course, experience uh, has lends a hand as well. A more experienced writer will come up with a more fluent script, as we can see here. Uh, this Virgil, 
written about uh, 1465, round about the time the type was introduced into Italy, printing was introduced in about the same year. Uh, and we can see something that is done by a real, uh, a, a person who's really uh, familiar with writing, who's a real professional uh, and has developed his own style. This came from the, uh, this is uh, uh, kept in the Bridensi Library in Milan. We can see very finely written um, uh, initials here in um, uh, majuscules. And look at these letters here. There is an entry stroke, a hook on the top and a hook on the bottom. Hooked hooks, hooks. These are, I would call these entry strokes and exit strokes rather than anything else. Uh, and But you can see the beginning of something rather different, a serif here and a serif here. So what's going on? Something is changing here. These have got serifs on, yeah, just like the Roman inscriptional letters. And a few of these have got serifs as well. A few, at the base of a few letters, there are something we could really call serifs. Uh, we've got a triangle serif on the top here. That is very calligraphic. And this is also calligraphic, this hooked exit stroke. So e entry strokes and exit strokes are one thing, but these, uh, these um, uh, serifs that we see here, here, and a few other letters are something rather different here as well. Well, uh, this, is a, um, this is from Padua. Um, it's a humanistic script. This is given to me by um, Ewan Clayton. I think it comes from the British Museum. Uh, and here we can see very clearly uh, how uh, things are changing. These are not entry strokes and exit strokes. These are Romanized um, serifs taken from the uh, inscriptional uppercase. So there you have it. The idea here was to regularate, uh, to, to, to standardize writing, to make a more unified uh, relationship between the capitals and the minuscules. And that's why on certain minuscules, uh, the, at the base of the letters, we see these um, inscriptional serifs. That, um, well, you know, that led very quickly to type uh, in almost no time at all. Nicholas Jensen's Roman was produced in Venice in 1470 for his, um, for his um, famous um, Eusebius. And uh, this is the first really Roman type. And we can see how it was influenced by uh, calligraphy, the Paduan uh, uh, developments of humanistic script. Uh, but it's different. It's different. It's, it's regular. Everything has re been regularized. And so we can really say this was the first fully Roman type. Uh, of course, the De Etna, which a lot of you will know about, uh, um, published by Aldus Manutius in um, 1495, was a development of this. But here we are really at the basics of things. And um, it's, a, it's a very beautiful type and has, been, has inspired many type designers over the centuries. Uh, well, We'll move on to something different here. Uh, here we have a, a type, uh, not a type, here we have lettering. Well, this is calligraphy here, and this is inscriptional, and it is a style of script known as uh, rotunda, uh, which started off as a script used in the University of Bologna, which is the oldest university in the world, they say, uh, uh, for, I mean, students had to pay copyists to write out the text, to copy the text. And they used, they adopted this style of writing, which became very popular in Italy. You can see it is rather angular. Uh, and you can see the D here has, it's very tight. The, the ascenders and descenders are pretty, uh, pretty restrained. And here you've got a D with a, um, with a horizontal. There's a lot of uh, sharing of strokes, that D shares a stroke with E, that will, we call that a ligature, and the other D shares a stroke with the O, so there's a triple ligature here with the C that follows. It was also used for a while, only for a few decades though, at the beginning of the 15th century for uh, inscriptions. And we can see it here. And then quite soon they changed to when Roman, the revived uh, inscriptional Roman letters became popular, that disappeared for inscriptional letters. But it's the only case uh, in the history of inscriptions where we see lowercase letters. 
from thence on right up until the 19th century or 20th century, uh, 20th century, uh, for inscriptions, for um, uh, carved inscriptions uh, were only done in magic schools. And there we see Venice, uh, Nicholas Jensen's uh, version of a rotunda. He made five of them. Uh, Ricardo Alocco quite recently did uh, a wrote a very interesting uh, uh, piece on um, the influence also of Nicholas, Nicholas Jensen's rotunda. Of course, rotunda was used in type for all kinds of things, whereas the Roman script, uh, Roman Roman type was used for uh, for classical authors, uh, for um, for more vernacular titles. Um, and also for scientific and legal texts, this was this style was pretty popular. And it was also exported to Germany. They used it in Germany. Rackdold took it to Germany when he left Venice and went back to his hometown in Augsburg. Oh yeah, well, of course, this is the, um, the uh, maximum of uh, the Gothic script, the textura, no angles at all. Uh, for example, you can see the O that has, uh, that has six angles instead of curves. Uh, and that was finalized uh, in writing well before Gutenberg picked it up to, for his first type for his Bible, which you can see on the right here. Of course, the difference here is, I mean, there are ligatures, you can see plenty of that as well. Uh, it, was very regular. I mean, it's not easy to distinguish one copyist from another when they're writing this kind of text. It's very geometrical. It's very different. The, the approach is very different because there are no curves here. So they, there is a lot of human uniformity in the writing of this text, which is uh, unlike the um, uh, what I said of the humanistic script. Uh, and this is Gutenberg. There you are, just a, 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 a tiny portion of a column of his uh, Bible. And you can see here how Gutenberg managed to justify on the right and the left. You can't see the left, but you can see he managed to justify on the left by using uh, different, by using, uh, according to the amount of space remaining at the end of the line, he could put in a ligature or he could take out a ligature uh, if he needed to fill in more space. And then he would use abbreviations as well. That is the et, that's an ampersand, equivalent of an ampersand. They've got an abbreviation, sunt, uh, et cetera. So he could, I mean, Gutenberg managed what a calligrapher could never manage. Calligrapher never managed a justification on the right-hand side of a column. Well, let's change the subject a bit and talk about the so-called Mercantesca script, which is popular in Italy uh, from the 14th century right up until the 16th century. Uh, this sort of similar styles were used all over Europe as well. In England, they call it the secretary hand, and there were many versions of it. It's very difficult to pin it down uh, as a style because it was very quickly written. It was a vernacular script. This was used for its in Florence. And in Florence in the 14th century, there were huge numbers of, uh, of shops, of craftsmen that, uh, and banks as well, merchants, and they all needed to uh, to write down, so write down their transactions or write down, uh, ex explain things. And, uh, and that's why there were schools developed. I mean, there were girls who were learning uh, to write and read, which is something that didn't happen much uh, in, in, in other parts of Europe. And this script um, went on to other countries, went on to, other, uh, to all uh, most Italian towns and became very popular. Uh, in in this century and went right up until the 16th century. Well, I'll, I'll, if anybody can decipher that and uh, read it, I, I'd be quite willing to buy them a bottle of Prosecco because I mean, I mean, you need you need, really would need to be a paleographer to. But it's quite beautiful. I mean, it looks it's a notary's writing and you know probably some something to do with property and trans financial transactions. But there you are. Um, well, here's an attempt by how can I get rid of this at the top here? I can't see it. Oh, well, we'll do it, put it down here for the time being. Uh, yeah, this was, uh, um, this, this is an, uh, an explanation of some of the uh, styles that appear in Mercantesca. Okay, well, the A and the E there again, you see the E is just, it's got no counter, it's just a curve like a C with a, a, a horizontal line. And the C and an H, 
there you got you start from the bottom they go at the top and then you do uh you make a um a counter at the top and then come down like that and that is a d a d starting here and then coming up here and then down there d i etc and here you've got uh preso that means taken in 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 um it's a hot word which means take, taken in english and um, there's a there is a an abbreviation here that is pair and the cross on the, the crossover uh, on the stem here coming up here that means that means pr pair rezo uh and you've got various other ones here as well uh, that is quite useful if you want to learn how to write mechantesca uh well now what is this this is um from the will of nicholas jensen yeah, which is kept in the uh, archives in the uh, Archivio di Stato, the State Archives of Venice. And this is a photograph by Riccardo Loco. And this is a small part of his will, um, which is uh, written by him, written by him. It's, a, it's autographic. Let's, uh, let's try to understand a few of these words here and the progression of the letters. E, G, okay, one, two, two strokes joining into the O, which is quite easy there. N, which is not an uppercase letter, or it's a big lowercase letter, big, big minuscule. I without a dot. C again, starting from the bottom. O, break, a letter, a new stem. A, U, S, Nikolaus Jensen. J, E. There you've got the E again, N, S, st probably start, I don't know whether it starts at the bottom. It looks as though, no, it comes in here, maybe comes in here and goes into the top here from to make an O. That is an S and an O and an N. Uh, here there are a few abbreviations here. Uh, he's talking about his father, Quandam Ser Jacobi, J-A-C-O-B-I, De, as, I, as we saw before in that explanation of Mercantesca. Somavera, that is, should be Somavoir, uh, his, his hometown in France, which is about halfway from Paris to the Swiss border, etc., uh, etc. Et the next line here, we got Mente Licet Infermus. Yeah, that means he's a, a sane in body and in, um, in, uh, in mind. Manu propria, manu propria. Subscripsit, subscripsi, sub s u b s c r i p s r s i in fidem in fede premisorum etc. So it's pretty difficult. And um, the interesting thing is that the uh, Giovanni Battista Palatino, who is a great calligrapher, 16th century calligrapher, um, working in Rome, he was uh, a, a he wrote his famous Libra nel qualis insegna scrivere ogni sorta di lettera, a uh, book wherein uh, we teach every kind of letters. And here he's got two pages of uh, uh, Mercantesca. Mercantile, Mercantile, he calls it Venetian, Florentine, but he's also got Bergamo, he's also got Genova, Milanese. He's got, yeah, every town has its own, had its own style of Mercantesca according to. Uh, Joan Battista Palatina, but that's not true, of course. I mean, <laughs> that, but these, I mean, they look very nice, and he's had to fill up his book one way or another. And of course, these are cut into wood, all of the white space between the letters and inside the letters has been cut out. And this was the, the first calligraphy books were done in this manner. Well, now here's the revolution. It's a, not a very good, um, a, a very good slide here. The letters are a bit out of focus, and I looked everywhere. I should really contact the um, biblioteca, uh, the biblioteca Laurentiana of, in Florence. But here we have a very early example of the italic. Here is the beginning of another revolution, another revolution in writing. We talked earlier about the uh, humanistic script, and it's later. Uh, in, uh, later used as a basis for type. Here we have the, uh, and that's a book, that's a book script. Yeah, humanistic script was used exclusively for books. The Mercantesca script was used for mostly for uh, normal kinds of documents like um, um, all kinds of uh, type deeds, lawyers, 
and uh, normal merchants use the Mercantesca. Here we have something very different. This is Nicola Nicoli, one of the humanists, uh, writing out a new kind of script in the early 1400s. Um, this, of course, he was part of the humanist group as well, uh, that were hugely influential. Influential. They were and also sponsored by the Duke of Florence, uh, which helped. Um, and so here we have another, a second part of the Italian Revolution in writing. Uh, moving on a bit, uh, Aldous Manutius, uh, who uh, was um, printing books in, in Venice uh, from the 1490s up, to, up until when he died in 1515, here's an example of his handwriting. And there is uh, an influence of italics here. There's no doubt about it. There is an influence of italics. Uh, we can read that, um, and uh, it is also it's a request for the manuscript for his um, uh, St. Catherine's uh, letters. Here's another style of writing, very much more formal. This is quickly written. There's no pretension of uh, calligraphy here. This is quickly written script, which is based on the italics. Here we have real italics written by Bartolomeo Sambito. Um, and uh, there we saw it. We probably but what the, the the earlier example of uh, humanistic script I attribute to Bartolomeo San Vito. This one is definitely by San Vito, and we can see certain things here. The letters are joined up. Most of the letters are joined up, not all of them. Uh, look at that A with a, quite a pronounced stem that goes quite high up, almost on its way to becoming a D. Uh, the G, yeah, we've got the, uh, the, the top counter occupying the whole of the X height uh, and quite vertical and very long uh, descender as well. Uh, a very beautiful script. San Vito was a, 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 quite a famous calligrapher in his time. He, uh, he wrote a lot of books and he had an influence. We know that he had a relationship with um, Aldous Manutius. And this was the first italic script uh, type um, uh, printed by Aldous in italics cut by Francesco Griffo uh, in, in just the, the year before. They appeared in the St. Catherine uh, very briefly, sort of, um, a sort of in anticipation of this. This is the first book uh, printed in italics for a while, right up until almost up to the 1540s. They were. Uh, the influence of this style, the uh, italic style in type was colossal. People loved it and could read it easily and they liked it. It was completely new in type. And you can see that the, um, the uppercase letters here are quite small, very small, just as in writing itself, they were small. Uh, and you can see too, the A has a stem that goes pretty high, just like the San Vito we saw earlier. There are lots of ligatures here, probably too many. In fact, in his second script, when he seems that Aldous, uh, he had a, uh, a, um, a quarrel with Aldous uh, uh, after this, after this, um, the first of his, of uh, Ald the, the Aldine um, classics in octavo, he probably had a quarrel with him uh, over the property of this particular type. Anyway, he went on to make another type, another version, which is slightly better than this for a, a, um, a Jewish printer uh, in, uh, in Fano who used it for a Petrarch and paid tribute to Francesco Griffo, just as Aldous paid tribute in, uh, in, in, um, in, in this particular book to his punch cutter, uh, Francesco Griffo. Let's move on. Well, we're going back to um, wood uh, wooden, uh, egg, uh, excuse me, the, the very first example of a calligraphy manual, yeah? Il modo e la regola di scrivere littera corsiva ovvero cancelleresca Nuovamente composta per Ludovico Vicentini degli Arrighi. Uh, quite a name. Uh, yes. And that was quite obviously uh, a successful piece of work. I mean, people like this. 
uh, and this is the original book. There are many facsimiles on this. Uh, and today, I mean, even over the, over, over the last 40, 40 years or so, this has had a huge influence on contemporary calligraphers, uh, as we shall see in a moment. Well, there is Gian, Gian Battista Palatino, again, Giovanni Battista Palatino with his uh, portrait there. You know, these were important people. They, uh, important to the point that um, he could have a woodcut uh, in, uh, of a portrait of himself on the title page. It's a very fine piece of work. And they, the, the, uh, the, uh, the craftsman who cut this, uh, Wood was very expert as well and very just interpreting the letters written uh, by uh, Palatino. 1540. There's an example of written italics uh, by Bernardino Cataneo. You can see the style became pretty popular in Italy and elsewhere too. It's a beautiful style of writing, easy to read, nice to look at as well. Yeah. Well, here was another revolution within the revolution. Uh, this is uh, uh, Vespasiano Amfiareo's book. I uh, can't see, yeah. Un nuovo modo di insegnare a scrivere et formare le più sorte di lettere. It went through 19 different editions. It must have been hugely, po hugely popular. People wanted to write like that. Uh, people want not just the, the, um, the um, upper middle class, but you know, it came on to not just the secretaries who had to write decently, but others as well. This is slightly more vertical than uh, Palatino and Arrighi script, uh, very finely cut as well into wood. Uh, and we see something rather different here. We, for example, look at that R. We see an R which is uh, different to what we saw uh, from the R of uh, Palatino and Arrighi. This is um, the, based on the, uh, the right-hand side of, a, of an uppercase R, where you've got what looks like uh, a, um, the, the bowl and the tail coming down, uh, making a, an R with which some, which some of us use that in handwriting as well today, of course. Uh, okay, well, this, this became popular and had an impact on this man here, Francesco, Giovanni Francesco Cresci. That's a portrait of him, a copy of a portrait that was made in Rome. He was hugely influential and uh, a Milanese who went to Rome to work for the Pope in, in the um, uh, Chancellery of the Pope as a uh, scriptor, as a, a, a copyist. Uh, and very soon, he developed his own style of uh, chancery script, which we can see here. Uh, in a book he had printed in 1560, uh, is employed examples of different kinds of letters. And here we see something rather different. Yeah, we can see the R, the traditional R of Arrighi and Palatino, but we also see uh, uh, Amfiareo's R here. And we see something rather different. We see letters, the ascenders are clubbed, and look at that E, that's rather different as well, we've never seen that before, um, and this sort of thing here, Q, A, T, they're sprouting, um, uh, sprouting a swash there, and there you've got swashes and swashes, it's very narrow, um, the idea, I call this the Baroque version of the Chancery script, Baroque script. It was very much in keeping with Baroque, dec Baroque architecture and Baroque art in general. That, look at that R, look at that C contained within, uh, containing the, the, the lowercase letters that follow. Um, so this became the, the revolution within the, uh, the uh, script revolution uh, and became hugely popular all over Europe, as we'll see. Well, there again, uh, you know, he had his, uh, although this was this was, cu was cut into wood, uh, he said that, um, uh, Kreshi said that um, wood was far more faithful, cutting in wood was, would be far more faithful than cutting or than um, uh, engraving on copper. This uh, title page, of course, is done in, on copper. And this is type here, which has been inserted in on a different press and there you can see him there again look how important we are you know with cherubs with their wings holding up a mirror of 
Giovanni Francesco Cresci and all kinds of other animal, animals. That became hugely popular as well with calligraphers. Well, there you get a better idea of uh, Cresci's letters in Italian. Um, and he had many, uh, many students worked with him. Look at that H there. Starts on the top and comes down like that and moves into the into the next letter, into the E. Well, it was, the idea was this, uh, uh, there were two ideas basically, that it should be uh, decorative, beautiful, but quickly, to, qu easy to write quickly. That was the idea. And it was, it, it caught on like wildfire. Uh, here we have an example of a, um, a uh, oh, sorry, that shouldn't be there, a papal bull, uh, that means a, um, a, a letter that was sent by Pope on parchment, copied on parchment to the uh, bishops all over the, all over Christendom. And there you see it, there you see this crashy style of the Baroque um, script, the Baroque, uh, Baroque italics is crept in here very uh, very obvious, look at that P, we've seen it before. And that's it, uh, that was the new script. Here, another one here of the many Italian uh, calligraphers who produced their own manuals. This is obviously done on copper. Uh, and you can see the same style there uh, and, the, and the signature here, Tiranti. Here's another one, Leopoldo, Leopardo Antonazzi, 1638. Lots of animals written with uh, without raising the pen. Well, of course, you could do that on copper, but you'd have to raise the pen here because uh, you would run out of ink after two or three of these um, piggy tails here, making dolphins and all kinds of other decorations. But the style of writing is uh, is almost secondary here. You know, he's showing off how he can make these uh, these wonderful decorations as well as produce this excellent writing. There you can see it quite big here. Yeah. Oops, no, that's too small, isn't it? Get back to the normal. Sorry. There we are. Uh, well, you know, that it spread all over Europe. Um, and here we have this great calligrapher, Jan van der Velde, Spiegel der Schriftkunst, the art of writing, 1605, uh, engraved on copper, a very beautiful piece of writing very competent, very nice to look at, you know, even these squirrels here. I mean, he has, uh, he has um, avoided the temptation to make dolphins and parrots and whatnot, uh, but uh, it's, you know, it's a beautiful piece of writing and that was the intent to make beautiful writing. But of course, Louis Barbador, a French calligrapher, went beyond that, went beyond that. He transcended legibility. He transcended the necessity of writing to be necessarily legible. He wanted it to be a work of art and he succeeded, he succeeded. Yeah, we can read it still, <coughs> uh, but uh, uh, there again, this was, cut, uh, this was engraved on copper and look at his signature here. It reminds me of um, the Zapfino logo, uh, as Herman Zapp Zapfino logo, which is circumscribed with an oval like that. Um, and there you are, that is also, you know, there is a similarity there with the, the Cresci influence is still there, or that it's taken a step further away. This is another, there even more so is the Cresci influence with these clubbed ascenders. Uh, it's, a, it's a work of art and he's saying that now calligraphy is a work of art. It didn't really correct, uh, uh, move into that in a big way, I mean, um, Western calligraphy could never become a work of art like Islamic calligraphy or like uh, uh, Chinese or Japanese calligraphy could, uh, but there you are. Well, England, uh, Edward Cocker, the pen's transcendency or fair writings labyrinth. Uh, I just read this very quickly. We're, we're, in, in, we're in fair writing to the life's expressed in sundry copies clothed with art's rich vest, by which with practice thou mayst gain perfection as heaven-taught author did without direction. Heaven-taught, well, he was probably taught by Crescia, well, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the manuals, one of the Italian or continental manuals, you know, there he is saying that God himself handed this writing down to him rather, um, rather conceited to say the least. And there he's got parrots uh, being held with by cherubs 
with the continuous squirrels and all that. It's been getting way beyond control, but there you are, Edward Cocker, 1657. Something um, a little bit more restrained here, George Shelley, uh, a bit later here. Uh, here we've got something rather different, very smooth, very regular letters that are on their way to becoming what we call the copper plate script. Yeah or they, they didn't call it a copper plate script, they called it the round hand, English round hand. Well, let's have a look at that, how it progresses. Uh, Thomas Tonkins and his portrait by Joshua Reynolds, who along with Gainsborough was one of the most important painters in the 18th century England, yeah. So to be painted by Joshua Reynolds, you need to be pretty successful in your job. I mean, these calligraphers had schools. They also had teachers teaching uh, arithmetic and uh, maybe algebra and English as well as calligraphy. And here we have something that is we can recognize the copper plate script here pretty easily. Uh, it's there, everything is there. Um, you know, I like that P, just one stroke here and a double stroke here, downwards and then upwards again. Um, this was destined to be, this of course was, 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 uh, was written and then, uh, and, then, and then engraved on copper and printed from copper. Um, it, it's, it's rather different from what we saw on the continent. Uh, it's moving in a different direction. It's ready to become the commercial script for the British Empire. Yeah, with their, uh, their ships and their armies and their aggression, they invaded how many different countries, countries and developed their colonies all over the world. And so this script was destined to become uh, the commercial script and later on the script used by the whole world. It became hugely successful. Uh, here we have William Brooks, another piece, uh, where he is showing uh, the Italian hand. I will talk about that in a minute. The Italian hand, you can see it's got the thick parts uppermost on the letters. Uh, Italian, yeah, okay. It's the influence of Cresci's originals is there, so we can call it the Italian hand, as he did. Uh, but let's see what he says about this. Uh, rec recommending the Italian hand to the ladies of Great Britain, uh, which as your own, I recommend to your choice and practice being full of beauty, ornament and delight and invented for the sole use and embellishment of your fair sex and am, ladies, your humble servant, William Brooks. Well, what about that for the exclusive use of ladies? Why did he choose that? just for ladies. How extraordinary. Anyway, uh, you know, probably, I mean, other calligraphers suggested that ladies weren't able to write uh, as well as men, so they needed something a bit more simpler, simple, and this was, uh, this was suggested as a simpler way of writing. Well, you know, today we know that some of the great calligraphers are women, so we won't say anything more about that. Well, this was the great book, uh, a collection of the calligraphers uh, or the pen men, as they used to call themselves, uh, published in 1741, engraved and published by George Bickham in London. Uh, and here we see the work of many of the, um, showing their samples, many of the, uh, the important and successful calligraphers of his time. Well, here we have the difference between the round hand or the copper plate script here, and the Italian hand, and that is also shown in the universal penman. We can see, why is it called the Italian hand? Well, we can see it's, it's, uh, it's got these club descenders, so it is more closely related to the, um, to the uh, Baroque uh, Crescian style of two centuries earlier. Uh, there's another example, yeah, of the, uh, from the universal penman. Uh, very, very um, clear uh, and sharp contrast between thick strokes and thin strokes, written with a quill, a fine pointed quill. Cresci also sharpened his quill to make a point. And here you can see how it was done at that time. Oh yeah, well, this is, this is a painting that's in the Tate Gallery in London. Uh, it's Kitts. Uh, writing lesson. Look how he's struggling, that poor boy, while his sister looks on uh, sewing something. 
And, uh, you know, he really is having a tough time with the angle of uh, the angle of inclination. It's pretty very much um, inclined, about 55 degrees, I think, is the uh, is the norm. Uh, it was standardized by the uh, calligraphers in the universal penman. Uh, and there you can see, I mean, it's, it's not easy to handle. That's why uh, the um, manufacturers of, of pointed pe pen nibs came up with uh, an elbow nib, uh, which had a built-in um, a built-in uh, uh, way of overcoming that difficulty of making the curve. I think that's a wonderful painting. Though. I like that very much. Just really is suits the 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 problem of writing with a pointed pen. Writing the um, the copper plate script with a pointed pen. Well, on the back to the continent, back to uh, Italy. Here we are. I, I should say, of course, my talk this evening is very much. Um, uh with an italian uh touch that's because i've been living here for 50 years uh, so i don't make any apology for that well the italians picked up in the 18th century they picked up french styles made a distinction between uh an italian alphabet which is very similar to french alphabet it's hardly difficult very difficult to make a difference uh and here this is called the french um uh, or the alphabet of Francesi, the French alphabet. Um, and you can see some rather interesting, strange letters for us. I mean, that would be uh, an M and an N rather than a U. That's a U there. Uh, and this was picked up as the writing style, uh, a development of a writing style that became quickly uh, popular in Italy during the 18th century. And here we got quickly written script letters uh, 18th century letters showing the influence of that style. It's still written with a broad nib, yeah, uh, not with a, uh, not yet with a, um, with a pointed pen. But the pointed pen came in fairly soon. A, in the beginning of the 19th century, it's said that the English had a warehouse in Leghorn, what the English call Leghorn and the Italians call Livorno, uh, on uh, not far on the Tuscan coast. And um, the, uh, the commerce with the local tradesmen, uh, they need to make invoices and the English invoices were written with the, cop with the, the, the round hand script, as we see here. A distinction is made between the two, the round hand English script, maiscolo al inglese, uh, Magischools, the English style of Magischools, and here we have the bastard French style of uh, of writing of uh, minuscules, bastardo they called it. Yeah, and he even shows the way are uh, they. Uh, it looks exactly the same to me the way their the um, their pen is held. However, just uh, a short interlude to discuss the United States. Of course, in America, the Spencerian script was hugely successful. I shouldn't, you know, I mean, of course, I expect most of you and listeners or, uh, in the United States will know all about this, know much more about it than I do. And many different manuals were uh, published. As, and this was a business script. The idea was to produce simple, uh, reasonably beautiful letters written quickly. That was the aim. And despite the introduction of the typewriter in the 1870s, uh, it's said that in one year, one of these manuals sold up to 4 million copies. That's really amazing. So it was hugely successful. It continued the tradition of these hugely successful manuals, uh, European manuals and British manuals, and of course, American manuals too. Uh, well, let's look at this example. Uh, the Palmer method, which was a, probably a development of the Spencerian script. And here it is, uh, the Palmer method written. Uh, these were lithographed. They weren't, they were, uh, they were printed uh, lithographically and not by um, engraving on copper, but engraving on lithographic stones. And that you can see that you can see that it's a it's it's just beautiful script. I think it's a uh, it's got a lot to say for it. It's uh, you can see that it's written quick, quickly, easy to read, and nice to look at. Now, how was that translated into type? This is, I think, one of the most ex 
extraordinary script, Carpenter script. I'll read it together. A Carpenter script was originally produced by the Cleveland Type Foundry in 1882. It was based on the handwriting of one Ron Carpenter, who worked for the Ho uh, Printing Machine Company in New York. He was an employee of the Ho Company. Uh, based on the handwriting of Ron Carpenter and uh, and uh, put into cut into type metal because they uh, for electrolytic matrices by James West. This is the digital version. Well, I think it's one of the very few so-called circular scripts that sprung up uh, among American type foundries at the end of the 19th century. One of the very few that has achieved uh, some success as a digital script. I think it's amazingly streamlined. I think it's clearly based on uh, the um, uh, Palmer method. Uh, you can see certain letters are very similar. Uh, and um, I think it's a very beautiful script. I'm just going to blow that up a bit. I don't like the uh, uppercase very much. I think, um, you know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Carpenter would have done better to stick to something simpler of the Palmer method, but there you are. Uh, back to Italy, the um, scrittura inglese, the English writing. Yeah, and this is the a manual for the copper plate script from 1940. Look at that, they're still using gothic -y titles in 1940. But here, uh, Professor Lamano, who is a very successful uh, teacher of calligraphy, uh, he explains how this style of writing had its origin uh, in the um, in the cancelleresque, the creche style of chancery script that he shows in this alphabet below. So there you are, he's, he's uh, uh, saluting the Italian tradition. Uh, and this is another ma uh, master of calligraphy, a professor, Giovanni Tonza, very successful, uh, uh, lithographically produced uh, um, uh, um, manual. Uh, and there you can see the Italians uh, had a T, a, a, a majuscule T, which is rather different from what the English use, because here it's based more on the unsealed T, whereas the English T generally goes in the other direction. Uh, rather than moving along the stem to the right, it moves to the left. So that was an exception, an Italian exception. That's rather an interesting Italian cue as well. Uh, and there were various other uh, particularities. Um, we can see here uh, we can see how it was translated into type, uh, into handwriting. So that was um, uh, engraved on, uh, lithographically engraved. Here we can see the writing done by a, um, done by a municipal employee in the uh, town of Crema in Northern Italy. Uh, and you can see how this writer was very professional and he enjoyed writing. He liked doing these sort of returns on the top of the letters that were so popular also with the Mercantesco script. Um, he, look at the way he writes, il sindaco means the mayor. So this is a letter that he's writing out on behalf of the mayor of Crema. Look at his work for il sindaco. It comes in here and then he does a, 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 a squiggle here, comes up and then comes down and does a piggy tail on the left there. And then look at the, word, the S comes in here, up, down, a piggy tail and that. So he's really enjoying it. He says he enjoys writing. Of course, that's a rubber stamp of the, uh, of the, um, the name of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the mayor of Kramer. And this is probably the pen that he, the nibs that he was using. I think that's absolutely marvelous. One of the most beautiful labels, chromolithograph labels, where you've got an alpinista who's wearing the alpine hat. And instead of a feather, he's got a pointed pen produced by the uh, famous pre presbytero, uh, producer of pencils and pens uh, right up until the 1960s. Uh, we got a recipe here for merluzzo la veneta. That means uh, a cod in the in the in the Veneto style, written by Signora Norma Rossetti, aged fourteen in nineteen twenty six. And there you can see the obvious, obviously based on the style she learnt when she was at school, uh, uh, based on the on the uh, copper plate on the uh, round hand script. And it's very regular. It's very very convincing as a beautiful piece of uh, piece of writing. Well, there again, translated into script, into type. There you've got uh, one of the pages we did for the 
uh, for our little booklets that went on for almost 20 years. We set the type ourselves and we, uh, and we printed from type that we were able to get hold of. Uh, oh yeah, the F is missing because that we couldn't find it in the type case. Well, of course, that is uh, Alessandro Buti's Fluidum. Uh, which is yeah, it's still the root is still there in the uh, in the uh, round hand, uh, but it's an original piece of work, and we we've used that for several on several occasions in our booklets at the uh, Bauer School in Milan. Uh, yeah, well, here's something far closer to our times. Uh, Richard Lipson's Bickham Script Pro, but based on George Bickham's script, and look at that. Rhythm and blues in what with many different flourishes, uh, and each one of them very, very convincing and very uh, useful. We became hugely successful as a wine label type um, uh, around about 10 years ago. I don't think it's probably gone out of fashion now, but I think it's very successful interpretation of uh, of script of a, uh, a copper plate script. Yeah. Well, here's um, Luca Barcelona, the great Luca Barcelona, who's a friend. He was also a student of mine working for uh, Absolute Vodka. Uh, and that's a piece of um, uh, calligraphy I did for a, a client who wanted to have a musical festival, but uh, the client didn't accept it, as so often happens. And um, that's one good reason to give up calligraphy today because they can do it much cheaper using type. Uh, calligraphers tend to be more expensive. So you have to be a very good calligrapher to compete with type. My students became much better than I, did, than I ever was. So uh, I, today I uh, fall back at my, um, my advancing old age uh, teaching uh, and uh, writing and giving lectures, which I like doing. So, well, let's look at how the, uh, the ministries the, of the Republic, of the Italian Republic, uh, use their copper plate script in different manners. You know, each one does his own style. That was, that's not a typeface. That's not, that was actually cut, probably cut into wood and they made it, made cliches out of it. That was uh, from, 19, from the 1980s. I, I made a photocopy of that. And these are also used today. Any kind of script that has a similarity to the original uh, copper plate script, which is obviously became the model when uh, after the unification of Italy um, in, in 1861, and it's never changed. Well, it has changed here because each one, each ministry does his own, uh, does their own interpretation of the same. Look at that awful uh, suppository instead of a um, instead of an apostrophe. Isn't that horrible? Uh, well, you know, we've seen worse than that. How about this? Ministry of Justice. Oh, I suppose some of you might even recognize that. That is uh, Roger Escoffon's Mistral, believe it or not. Uh, but with <laughs> they put spaces between the letters, which makes it rather comical. Uh, you know, it's very comical to see it used uh, by this Ministry of Justice. But there you are. Um, and I'm a great fan of Roger Escafons and especially of Mistral. I know a lot of graphic designers hate Mistral and very few of them love Mistral. I, I adore Mistral and I would just like to pay tribute to uh, Bruce Kennett, uh, who gave a lecture on Escafon in 2019, which is absolutely brilliant. I recommend it. A lecture on the um, on the. Um, uh, Cooper Union platform. So look for that. It is really worth, uh, really worth looking at and listening to him. He's brilliant. Oh yeah. Uh, well, you know, what about that? I mean, that uh, that almost takes. It's almost better than Mistral, isn't it? There or badly used Mistral uh, that we saw in the previous slide. I mean, it's so awful. Uh, and you see these on gravestones as well. It's absolute. It's an absolute travesty of anything that is decent to look at and decent to read. You know, and there's hardly any distinction between the dot and the and the um, and the stem of this lowercase i. So it's it's just the thick and thins have almost completely disappeared. Let's move on to something that's slightly more decent. Uh, well, here we've got another style of calligraphy that became popular with the intro the uh, in Napoleonic invasions of Italy at the beginning of the uh, well the late very late uh, 18th century and the uh, and the early 19th century when uh, they um, set up what was first the Regno d'Italia and later became the 
the <clears throat> or the uh, Reign of Excel and later became part of the empire, the Napoleonic Empire. This is the rotunda, the ronde, introduced by the French. Uh, and it was picked up by the Italian calligraphers uh, and it was used in the whole of the 19th century and right up until almost today. I mean, I've seen certificates from the 1970s where the name of the person is written in the uh, rotunda and the rest of the blurb is written in, uh, in um, uh, roundhand, in the Italian version of roundhand. Well, this is from a manual, Model Models of Calligraphy, uh, 1898, and it became hugely important. Here's another uh, manual, and you can see it is used for names. Uh, well, here they're showing off um, the um, proficiency in Gothic writing as well. Uh, and there's a monogram, which is worth looking at. Uh, and there you've got it, the, um, the use of copper plate script or the roundhand script together with the rotunda. I think they work very badly together, but that's just my opinion. Uh, and then we have something different as well. At the beginning of the 20th century, sorry about the quality of this uh, photograph, uh, we have the introduction of the vertical script. Uh, why? Well, it's quite simply because of that painting we saw um, earlier. Uh, it was difficult for children to learn how to write on a very, a, a very much inclined angle. So they changed it. They used, still used the pointed pen, but they decided it would look, it would be much easier to write vertical script. And there you see an example of it. It's just the round hand vertic made, made vertical. Well, this happened to in other European countries as well, I think, not just Italy. Um, let's see how this translated into writing. Well, there you are. Uh, this was written with a pointed pen and ink, and the quality of the paper is very poor because at this time in 1937, uh, the uh, League of Nations had, um, had uh, sanctioned Italy and there was an embargo, nobody could export to Italy. So they had very bad quality paper and, uh, and that's why it's, um, uh, it's browned, it's got brown edges here. Why did they put an embargo on Italy? Because of Italy's invasion of Ethiopia, where they gassed and bombed the Ethiopians until they were kicked out by the English during the Second World War. So there you are, that's uh, a connection between um, uh, Italian imperialism and this particular style of script. Of course, these poor uh, school children had to write out, um, had to write out quotations by Mussolini, and this is one of them. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, or how long is this? 1937. So what's that? A good while later. I, I mean, 60 years later, exactly 60 years later. Here you have uh, not the pointed pen, but a biro, a, um, uh, a, a ballpoint pen uh, written by uh, uh, Claudia Scarpolini, who's my next door neighbor, um, aged 11. And you can see this is easy to read. She wrote very well and that she's got a bravo. Well done, Claudia, very good for you. Uh, and um, this is the style of writing that they use today or it's what should be taught in the schools but it's not always taught that well because this particular pupil uh, understood how to write, understood that model and she applied herself and came up with something which is absolutely legible. Legible, not illegible. Uh, well, just back to uh, Roger Excafon again. I can't can't resist him here. I mean, um, I won't go. I won't step on uh, <clears throat> Bruce Kennett's toes at all here. But um, this was a brilliant interpretation of the way people wrote in the 1950s. Uh, he uh, originally Excafon um, got. A, a couple of his assistants to scout all over France to see how people wrote. And he tried, but he, he tried and tried, but then he fell back on his own style of writing. And look at that P and look at that L, a double L, that's a ligature. So one L is closed and the other is open. Uh, and he's got, you've got a TH ligature uh, and an O-N or an O-U ligature. You could write my surname with that. Um, and uh, and it, was, it, it was a popular, type. It was popular for setting type, especially with um, small print shops. And there's, there's his handwriting uh, where he's talking about his shock typeface. And you can see, um, you can see how this does have elements of his, uh, of his mistrial as well. 
Well, uh, let's come back to uh, England here. Um, you know, we talk, we, we, we talk, we'll be talking about Johnston, Edward Johnston in a moment, but before him, uh, Stanley Morris, uh, William Morris, and uh, this um, lady, Monica Bridges, were interested in Renaissance italics. And Monica Bridges uh, wrote a book and published a book, A New Handwriting for Teachers at the end of the 19th century. And there we can see that this does have the influence of italics. There he is, uh, Edward Johnson, who is very much beloved by calligraphers, uh, even today, especially Italians. Uh, and there's a page from his famous book, uh, Writing, Illuminating and Lettering. It's gone through God knows how many editions. Uh, this is from the first edition, uh, 1906. I like that photograph of him with his improvised drawing board and a quill, uh, hard at work uh, copying, um, copying, um, uh, early styles. Well, this was a revolution because in England, pre previous to this, I mean, he had his influence pretty strong with the uh, British middle classes, certain sections of the middle, British middle classes who wanted to change over to Italic handwriting. Uh, so he had a profound influence in that sense. Uh, of course, he didn't manage, it was never applied by the Minister of Education. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that in a, later. Well, he, you know, I mean, by our hero Hermann Zapf, uh, a very well-known piece of calligraphy, and it's a beautiful piece of writing, I think, you know, and there he's got a quotation by, uh, by um, William Morris's collaborator, uh, the bookbinder Thomas, Thomas uh, Copeland Sanderson. And there you are, I'd like to, I mean, I'd like to take this opportunity also to give my uh, tribute to Hermann Zapf, who was a friend and uh, admired all over the world, of course. Well, this is another, uh, uh, this is an Italian calligrapher uh, who was one of the founders, along with myself, um, in uh, 1991 of the Associazione Calligrafica Italiana. And there you see her interpretation of italics, um, uh, which I'm very fond of as well. She knows how to handle swashes better than most of us. Uh, what about uh, scripts? How was one well, about italics? How was that managed into type? Well, here we've got a quickly written script with a ballpoint pen done by uh, Max Kaflisch, who is a, a name some of you may remember, a Swiss um, Swiss typographer. Uh, and look at that! I think it's a beautiful piece of writing. Writing quickly in italics like that is not bad. Michael Harvey was able to do nice uh, handwriting. Uh, as well, quickly written handwriting, or even though he wasn't a calligrapher at all. But I think that is absolutely marvelous. And this Adobe uh, Catholic script interprets that, um, manages to get that um, liveliness, I think, uh, or some of that liveliness uh, in Catholic script, as we see here, 1993. Well, of course, today with the digital, uh, digital, um, um, platform, uh, dig, uh, digital um, applications for designing type, there are several of them. Uh, there, there's been a huge influx of uh, handwriting fonts. I um, mean, this was in 2016. And now there must be um, probably more than a thousand handwriting fonts available today. I mean, you can choose your, you can choose even your your favorite painter, uh, Cezanne, and uh, use his uh, his style of handwriting or Monet or whatever. Uh, and there you've got it. You know, there's just so much available today. But I think there is nothing quite like um, quite like writing done by hand. Uh, very often when I'm, I teach typography and I, don't, don't, I also teach calligraphy, I teach one or two styles of calligraphy, but in my typography course with university students, I sometimes ask them to um, show me their handwriting, show me an example of their handwriting, uh, you know, just, just as though they were doing a shopping list. Uh, and they do that. I say, you know, don't try to do anything fancy. Use a buyer, use a pencil, use whatever you use normally. And I'm not, you know, just, you're not trying to do a beautiful piece of writing. Just imagine that you're writing a note to somebody. Mm. Uh, and this is what they came up with here. Okay, these are international students, although I think that was probably done by an Italian student. Uh, and we can read this reasonably well, you know. Um, some of it is, occasionally we see, uh, they don't use, um, they don't use um, cursive handwriting, they just use manuscripts. Uh, 
and sometimes the connections are not there. Sometimes the um, letter the uh, letter forms are a bit uh, weird. But let's see what the Italians did. Oh, look! I've just gone out to do some shopping there. That's pretty weird, isn't it? Uh, the problem is that people aren't used to writing by hand anymore. They're not used to handwriting. They, a lot of them have given it up, or if they can, uh, if they need to do something by hand, they do it in uh, magic schools and not in cursive uh, letters. This is done by Italian students. Uh, goodbye. I've uh, oh hello. I've just gone out to do some shopping. Ciao, sono andato a fare la spesa. Lots of different styles here. One or two different um, instruments as well. Uh, there you got one, two, three who don't use uh, cursive uh, minuscules at all. They don't, uh, they're just not used to it. So they do it in um, magic schools. Uh, yeah, rather unusual writing here. Getting a bit out of control there. Two styles of A here. Look at that A. We could make that a little bit bigger. Starting here, doing no, starting here and doing twice coming back here and then making the A like that rather complicated. Here is there's a typographic A which looks quite nice, and then here we got a script A as well. And then he goes, or he or she goes back to the typographic A there. And here we got the typographic A here as well. Um, well, you know. Uh, the problem is, the problem is, um, there are two problems here. One is that handwriting is not taught properly. Handwriting is taught in primary schools by people who have been not really learnt it themselves. So there's no method that is taught. Uh, and that's a big problem to get decent handwriting. Uh, this was done by a student of mine in, in Switzerland, in Lugano, uh, where she did a thesis on handwriting, showing several different pen groups. Look at that, holding a pen as though it were a fishing rod. Extraordinary, absolutely amazing. Um, and here she did uh, some, she gave some ideas of common ways of writing. This is uh, not, um, not suggested, and this is suggested. Sconsigliato e consigliato. That's an A, which is an unorthodox A. That's a, a good way of writing an A. Another way of writing an A, good way. That's an, a real weird, a weird, way of writing a G, another weird way of writing a, G, a Q, and here we got an, a, a, an N, an N, there's an entry stroke, and it's looking like a U, yeah? Uh, and the same thing with an N, that's an N, believe it or not. Pensono manualita, manualita, very difficult for us to read. Uh, and an R, we got an R here. And a C, a C which became an E, poike, P-O-I-C-H-E with, an, with a uh, grave gra accent. The R here has become an uppercase R, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, scriptura. Well, uh, this is quite amazing because at least one country has uh, adopted the italics as the model to be used for teaching children in primary schools. And that is Iceland. Thanks to Gudrunga, uh, uh, Gun, Gunlauga Brem, which many of you may know, and I, a brilliant Icelandic man of type and calligraphy and, um, and various other things as well. Absolutely brilliant. And here is a, um, our, the, um, is part of an instruction manual. Uh, and of course, this Freya Bergsvein Dottir, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that, that very beautiful smiling face. She works together with uh, Briem, uh, Gunlauga Briem, uh, and they have done this successfully. Uh, and there you've got the Icelandic alphabet. Uh, well, here's an, here's an Italian organization, uh, Scriver in Amman on Nell'Era Digitale. SMED. Uh, it's a group of uh, friends who have set up this project. They've got a wonderful uh, s a website uh, and they, uh, they try to teach teachers how to write decently. And they are doing a lot of very good work as well, I must say. Uh, they've done a, a couple of books here. This is the, uh, up the Magicals and Minuscules for teaching uh, children. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm very 
I follow them closely and I think they do very well. Of course, uh, the uh, ACI, the uh, Associazione Calligrafica Italiana, also has teachers who are working on uh, in, in schools. And here we have a group of children who are learning italics, simplified italics, monolinear italics, as we see here. Uh, so, you know, people are doing things in, uh, on this front here. It's, it's going to be a huge pity if because of emoticons or smartphones or the convenience of the convenience of emoticons, you know, these horrible, ugly faces that look so bad. I never use them and I hate when friends send me their messages with emoticons. Uh, you know, they, 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 they're just a substitute for thought. You know, if you want to express an emotion, express it in writing, not with a stupid face that everybody else with teardrops or hearts all over the place that everybody's using. Get back to writing. I mean, even if it's writing on a, on a telephone, it's better than using bloody emoticons. Anyway, there you are. Uh, Alex Barocco, who's one of the um, one of our um, uh, very expert teachers of calligraphy, but she also teaches in primary school. Of course, there is a distinction between uh, professional calligraphy and artistic calligraphy and um, uh, uh, writing, handwriting, uh, which needs to be understood. We need to make this uh, this uh, distinction. Well, in 2016, uh, in Milan, we held the Associazione Calligrafica Italiana, uh, convened uh, an international conference to discuss the future of handwriting. And we had people like, uh, we had people like um, uh, Ewan Clayton, um, who's written a, a very beautiful book on, uh, uh, very excellent book on, on the history of writing, uh, and Brody Neuensch and uh, uh, other international figures came along and for two days we thrashed it out. And then this led to a, um, to a uh, handwriting manifesto, which I've got here. Handwriting manifesto, where we, we, uh, we appeal to the authorities to get back to understand the importance of teaching handwriting. It's, it's a, uh, the art of everybody. Everybody's art was handwriting. People were proud of their handwriting. I mean, wait, I can remember as a, as a schoolboy, you know, receiving a letter. I mean, when I was, when, even up until the time I was 20, before I came here in Italy, I lived in the same city in London with my father, who was just, a, you know, not far away. We used to write letters to each other once a week. And then, of course, you know, if you had a girlfriend, you know, you could send a letter to you and you could read, you could recognize a handwriting, the thrill of opening up an envelope and reading uh, someone from something that from a person you've got a crush on was really quite something and has, you know, cannot be replaced by anything digital. So this handwriting manifesto, which has uh, been now more than 40 countries have signed this, uh, so far we've not got uh, a Minister of Education that is supporting this. But here we've got the link, and I think Sasha afterwards is going to give that to you. And, uh, you know, if you're interested, if you hold these things dear, and I think we should do, um, to lose a 3,000 year old skill um, uh, is, is, is unforgivable. We need to hang on to that, uh, come what may with uh, digital, uh, digital um, progress and technological changes of one kind or another. I think we need to accept that handwriting is wonderful. We express our personality with handwriting uh, and you know, it's useful as for students as well. I mean, I've, for example, my students, I'm, when I'm showing stuff on the screen uh, and they have their com computer open, I said, what are you looking at? I said, well, first of all, what, 10 years ago, I thought we were looking at Facebook. I said, yeah, but close your, your, your uh, Macintosh and, you know, get out a pencil or a pen and write notes. You know, if you want to take notes, you should take notes, but write them by hand. But I, you know, I thought they were looking at Facebook, but they are actually typing in the notes on the computer. Well, it was fairly con conclusively proved uh, in America, I think, that um, you know you remember things much better uh, as a student if you're writing them down by hand than you do if you're mechanically hammering away on a keyboard. So there you are. That's just one other reason why we think that handwriting is important. So that's all, um, uh, I think. Um, I'd be very pleased to interrupt, uh, to um, uh, discuss anything or answer questions of any kind. Thank you very much.
Thank you, James. Um, let's see if we can get us side by side. We'll do some uh, some questions. I think we have uh, maybe like 15, 15 minutes or so from for for questions. Um, let me see, um, Mike, if you can pin us together, that'd be great. Um, let me go through some of the questions. Um, well, first of all, thank you, James. It's like a, a really, really interesting like trajectory throughout uh, history of of, uh, of all of these uh, <laughs> styles of writing. And it's like, it's always super, super interesting to see uh, a very cohesive kind of presentation like this that, that sparks a lot of ideas, a lot of thought. And I, I really appreciate the, um, the ending um talking about like the, the the current state of events and, and and the relationship of writing to learning so there's a very you, hate, you, you hate the Moticans as much as i do um i don't i don't um yeah i i you know i think um it, it's um i'm a big fan of writing um things down i think like the my brain works better if i um capture them rather than typed i think that there's just like a very different feedback to, to my brain and like how i i think started learning um so that's kind of fixed in my head i think i find emoticons like um have a particular place that i i um in terms of quick uh communication like in in not necessarily writing long things but i think that they there's a space that they've carved out um in 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 people's reactions and, and kind of something quick that um is a little bit easier uh so i yeah i'm off two minds i'm off two minds i think that there's like a a space in terms of like the evolution of, of certain punctuation i kind of think about like you know the invention of a semicolon let's say you know it's not quite like an emoticon but i'm i'm, I'm thinking of like grammatical shifts and, and and expansion of 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 writing to include more complicated uh, ideas like uh, uh like an interrobang you know which is sort of here and not there but like something yeah, yeah, well, that, that, that kind is of useful thing. isn't it the interrobang is is a, a yeah. useful addition to typography yeah yeah so yeah kind of like thinking about how people are always like looking to kind of fill a little bit of a space in there um there's there's a few things in in um there's a little bit um uh, some questions that were a bit more technical in terms of like so, some of the earlier things that there's a lot of really um, interesting things that that you you brought uh, to folks attention that were quite quite interesting I'm going to pick a couple that um, <coughs> that, that um, there's a question from from Kevin Woodland uh, at the start um, uh, hi James you made an interesting case for the development of serifs in the 15th century manuscripts would you say that serifs were developed independently in two different eras for two different reasons circa 200 BCE monumental Roman capitals and then again in the 1400s during the humanist era yeah I would say that's true um, if you know to find out more about um, serifs on uh, inscriptional Roman capitals on the imperial capitals uh, you know, you can't do better than um, than uh, that famous book by the oh, uh, Cattus. 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 Yeah, mm -hmm. the origin, the origin mm -hmm. of the serif. Yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, Cat has been criticised a lot, uh, and quite rightly so for certain things. But you know, I mean, I think his, I mean, his, he wasn't the first to uh, suggest that that serif, that uh, the lettering, the inscribed imperial letters were uh, first painted with a flat brush you know that was um, he wasn't the first to do that um, uh, but he was the first to show it practically with a brush uh, and um, I, I, I think that was a big contribution uh, to uh, you know the origin of the Serevich uh, I've got um, a, an old copy of that here I, I hope they I've been for the last 30 years, I've been hoping that someone would uh, make an Italian translation of that. But I've not found anybody so far. Um, it's a, it's a, it's, I think it's a great book. Um, the uh, 15th century application of serifs to lower, lowercase letters started off with calligraphy as a development of the humanistic script uh, in the uh, Pad uh, uh, Padua area near close to Venice, uh, where there are a lot of scribes working. Um, in the 14, 1450s and 60s, I mean, who's done, there are a lot of people who've done work on that. Ricardo Loco is among one of them. And then, of course, the, the idea was this, to make a, a more, uh, a, a closer relationship between the serif uppercase and the lowercase. So in certain, certain areas, in certain, with certain letters, you could put serifs, inscriptional serifs at the base of those letters. I mean, they, why didn't they do that on a T? 
for example. They could do it on an R, on an I, on an M, on an N, uh, but not on a U and not on an A. Uh, and they didn't do it on a T. I and mean, they could have done it on a T, but the result would be very ugly. So they, you know, they had an aesthetic uh, reason for leaving the T as it was with a, an exit stroke, uh, an exit stroke to the, uh, to the right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, that, I hope that answers the question. Uh, there's another, I'm kind of skimming through, there's a lot of questions, that, that's, it's always really great to see how um, the conversation sort of sparks a lot of um, ideas and a lot of questions. I'm going to try to keep some of the um, more technical ones kind of together. Uh, Laura Goldsmith asked the, if the uh, um, Mercantesca script is the same as the secretary hand, because in some model... Yeah, it's like yeah that, well, the secretary hand uh, was a rather rather different, but I think mean, basically I think the appearance is very similar, because the, but the secretary hand also had a sort of slightly more, I mean, depends on the writers. I mean, they these were written so quickly uh, that there are many... As I said, with the humanistic script, you know, the, the variety of uh, different hands can be immediately recognized. Uh, and the same was obviously even more so the case with, uh, you know, vernacular scripts like the, the Mercantesco or the secretary hand that was used in England. Yeah. And all over Europe, they had similar scripts, too. Mm -hmm. There's a question from from David, kind of maybe connecting a little bit more towards sort of the discussion at the end. Uh, David H. said, uh, asked, how did the shift to modern day literacy change writing styles? I noticed the shift to vertical handwriting and other things um, going over in, in inside the presentation, but whether tweaks were there. I also noticed, and I think it was commented in, in the chat, like a lot of the examples you showed from your students, like many of the the, the cursive uh, handwritten examples like were kind of leaning to the left quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, that that's that's another thing. I think, you know, I mean, some of those, uh, some of those examples from students, you can see that some of them are trying to uh, develop an idiosyncratic style, a personal style. And that's, that's always been the case, hasn't it? I mean, I, uh, I mean, people were proud of having a, a distinct, a, a distinct style of writing. Um, not just good handwriting, but, um, you know, I mean, when, when I was much younger, in the 1960s and 70s and in, in the 1980s, when, we, when I did a lot of writing of letters and that, you know, uh, I had my own style, and it was recognisable, immediately recognisable. Uh, you know, that happens so much less today, doesn't it? I mean, people, I mean, a lot of people in Italy, I've noticed, have very very round style of writing, very round and uh, and very vertical, but round and round and round. Uh, and that, I don't know whether there's a sort of gender question here, whether women uh, have that, I don't think so, but um, um, that that is a particular, uh, I've noticed that in Italian styles. I mean, I can tell the difference, I, I can tell very quickly tell the difference between Italian handwriting and uh, English English handwriting. They're different. Well, we had a different model. You know, mm -hmm. we didn't have the joint. Uh, uh, we didn't start with the joined up handwriting. We start with the ball and stick writing. When when I learned how to write in the nineteen, whatever it was, in the eighteen thirties or whatever, I can't remember. It's so long time ago. Um, yeah. So you, and this comes through in uh, in handwriting as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How many of us? How many of us still receive letters and write letters today? <laughs> it's, I know. Yeah. It's 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 all emails at this point. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question um, from Craig Eliason. Um, the italic hand with its thick tops, uh, might this uh, 18th century label in style influence the 19th century naming of the reverse contracts experiments uh, by Caslin and others, the Italian? Like, is oh, there yeah, now, that's a very interesting question. And I wrote a piece on uh, where I suggested that, um, uh, that for uh, Tipo Italia, it was in. Um, in a, um, a publication that came out for a while. I think we did three numbers. And one of those, I wrote an article on the Italian monstrosity, which was uh, the Caslin's, based on Caslin's Italian, which is hugely popular, not in England, but everywhere else in the world, in Portugal, in Brazil, in Mexico, in the United States, where they produced wood versions of uh, Caslin's Italian. In, even in Russia, they made Cyrillic versions of Caslin's Italian. It was, I mean, you ask David Shields about that, he'll be able to tell you 
a lot about Italian and, and Paul Shaw as well, of course. Uh, he knows a lot about these things. And, and it was considered a perverse, a perverse type by the English historians. Didn't like it at all. I mean, even Michael Twyman, who I, I hugely admire, criticized it as a perverse type. I think even Nicolette Gray considered it a perverse type. Well, it, you know, I mean, if you've got a, a certain way of thinking, it was a perverse type, but what, how nice the occasional perversity can be, you know, and, and, and of course, yeah, with the thicks, uh, the, the, the thicks at the extremities uh, with the, where the serifs were, you know, that, you know, that, that, um, that name, I think, must have come from, uh, you know, from the Crescian style of writing, from the Baroque, uh, the Baroque uh, Chancery script, yeah, with the mm -hmm. swollen terminations at the top of the ascenders, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a very strong relationship between yeah. a lot of these writing. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, question, yeah. though. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially like if in in that the sixteenth, seventeenth, and in, in certainly like squarely in the seventeenth century, how a lot of the writing masters and writing books uh, and calligraphy books like um, were influencing a lot of the type drafting. Um, yeah. towards the nineteenth century, you could see how those ideas are coming coming into um even even um we had uh you and clayton's lecture a few years back talking about yeah, the, the yeah. relationship of the, of the hand back into the type and talking about people like baskerville and like their training as as a writer as as a, uh, as a yeah. sort of um a calligrapher writer and, and a stone carver so like how he perceived letters um there was a question um i'm trying to kind of find where where placed it um there's a couple of questions um paul shaw who's, who's here uh watching and then there's another um question sort of in in the q a when you showed an example of grifo's italic um in that slide you have roman caps and then there's like the rest of the text that's set in italics and there's kind of a question uh, from from um uh cat hughes what, um what was the function of the uppercase letters within that and then paul's question about why there was a gap between the cap and the rest of the italic yeah well that that's that was quite normal with virgils i think it had something to do with um uh memory you know, you could, because I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot of mm -hmm. um, uh, students of Latin, you know, had to learn by heart um, the certain Latin authors. When I was, when I was at school, we, it was a punishment, you know, if we, um, if we did something wrong, we were punished either with a caning or we uh, sometimes, you know, we had to learn by heart a page of, um, a page of uh, Virgil or some other Roman author, yeah, and so that was, you know, that was probably. I think that was probably the the reason for it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what was the, the was like? Was there any um, function to like the gap because the rest of the word is, is yeah, kind that of, just set, you know to uh, so you could just remember uh, remember the initial. Um, oh, mm -hmm. good! Someone else is hating emoticons right <laughs> now. Uh, so you, the initial could become standing out. With that space uh, before the um, before the following lowercase letters, that was perhaps uh, presumed to be an aide memoir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting ideas about like mnemonics and and how letter forms and and um, shapes. You know, there's there's I think there's a famous page in uh, Geoffrey Torrey's like Champs de uh, Champs Fleury. Um, where he shows an alphabet and he calls the alphabet, I think, uh, a fantastique uh, alphabet. I think, yeah. he, uh, but I think that page came from a, from an Italian book from from I don't know, like a, a few decades before his book. I think he just yeah. took the alphabet. And I think that alphabet where the shapes are um, mm. like a, a C, sort of like a sickle. He uses like objects for that's these. That's right. Words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. that there were that, mostly that, that's a, yeah. That, there's a whole page of that. Uh, uh, there was a, a wonderful facsimile produced by, in France uh, of that book, Le Champ Fleury, was it 1535 or something like that? Uh, and uh, I picked that up very cheaply, but I, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know where you could find that uh, elsewhere. But I think as far as I know, it's the only facsimile uh, of that book and it was beautifully done. I've got it here behind my shoulder. Mm -hmm. Um, there's another question that's a little bit more um, to do with uh, uh, 
some of the examples you you were you were you were showing uh, Grifo's work. I think there's a there was and, and Jensen kind of talking about Aldi and stuff. Uh, there's a question about uh, Italian 15th century, and maybe this is a question you can answer, or maybe someone in the audience can can type in the chat. Um, the question was, in Italy in the 15th century, the Soncino Press printed the first Hebrew Bible. Might anyone know what Roman types they might have used for other publications or how to find out? Um, you know, in, in terms of like who made the the Roman type, was it was it Griffo? Do you know the Soncino uh, Press? Or? Yeah, well, uh, Soncino, the Soncino family um, in um here in northern italy not far from milan came from soncino they they um they adopted the name of the town and that was quite common in of, um, uh, italian jewry uh and um gerolamo soncino or gershom soncino to, to use his jewish name uh was an extraordinary man. He printed books in Greek. He printed books in uh, in Latin. He was a a, a, a wandering type, uh, wandering printer. Uh, he printed in about seven or eight towns along the Adriatic coast, according to the uh, acceptance or anti-Semitic uh, feeling that there was in the town where he was at the time so you know he moved on moved on he got at a certain point he got so fed up with uh, moving out and changing towns he went to constantinople and there he had the freedom to produce whatever he wanted <laughs> it's rather ironic he went to a uh, an islamic um uh city because uh, it had become of course you know the, the turks had the ottoman empire had uh, uh, already uh, firmly established itself in uh, Istanbul. Uh, and he, uh, Gershom Soncino, who I think was the, the grandson of the original uh, printers of the Bibles in, uh, uh, in Soncino, uh, he, he, I think he, he printed in Hebrew as well, and he worked with Griffo. He worked with Griffo in 1503. He published uh, a Petrarch uh, in Griffo's second Italic, which is very similar to his first Italic, uh, the Aldine uh, Italic, uh, but it was better. And it was, I think it was slightly bigger as well. And in that, there is on the first page, there is a tribute to, uh, to, um, to Francesco Griffo on Franciscus Bononiensis, uh, or Francisco, or maybe it was, it's in Italian, the, um, the, um, the introduction or the tribute by Gersom Soncino to uh, Griffo, who cut the Italic letters for him. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and um, so Gersom Soncino is very much appreciated in Israel, I know that. And of course, in Italy, we have the Jewish Printers Museum in Soncino. There's a little museum there. They haven't got any um, any of uh, the um, Jewish books, the original Jewish books, but they did make a uh, a museum and a tribute to that tradition of printing Hebrew books in Italy uh, that was quite strong in the 15th century. Because a lot of the um, a lot of the uh, Jews who were uh, kicked out of Spain by Ferdinando and Isabella uh, came to Italy. The same thing with the Portuguese Jews as well. Mm -hmm. There's a there's an interesting question too about the the like whether there was an influence from in the Middle East um, in Italy um, around that sort of Ottoman Empire and like the 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 invasions and kind of some of the conflicts that were going on. Is there anything that that could be attributed to some of this influx? Certainly in Spain, there was a a, a much bigger influence. Yeah, yeah of, of course. Arabic well, in Spain, they had the uh, the Moorish tradition that had been. Yeah established the great king uh, the great states in granada and um, whatever uh yeah I thought there was nothing similar to that in italy of course although of course the the um the uh in the 11th century in the 12th century i think too the um the arabs had uh, occupied uh, sicily right yeah. uh and um when the norman uh, kingdom arrived and the Norman kings uh, Ruggiero, uh, they, 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 they was sort of fairly equally divided between uh, the Latins and the Greeks as well in Sicily. The Greeks um, 
Magna Grecia in the east, eastern Sicily, and then of course the Arabs as well. So they had three, three different populations, uh, each contributing one way or another, yeah, to culture one way or another, yeah. If you go to Palermo and look at the cathedral, you can see the influence of the Greek mosaics there, the Byzantine mosaics, absolutely amazing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we probably have just enough time for one one question, maybe. Um, um, there was a question, uh, kind of a broader question, maybe is a good a good one to end on uh, by Lori. Uh, the question is, what is the single most influential scientific, historical or cultural development that affected the progress of writing? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Well, um, I, I would say uh, the earliest italics i think um we're talking we're talking exclusively of latin script of course i think the earliest italics had a lasting influence that is still with us today i mean ultimately your um ultimately your uh, um english roundhand your vertical italian scripts or which used in other countries in Europe as well. Your uh, American versions of the Spencerian script, ultimately they all go back to the italics. That is the root letters. I mean, they have nothing to do with Mercantesco or uh, Gothic script at all. So I think, you know, the biggest contribution to the history of handwriting was, uh, I think, um, the, um, the onset of the italic style. In the 15th century, it was adopted by the is adopted by the um, by the papacy for the chancery. Martin V, the Pope, in about mid 15th century, became script used for papal communications, the bulls, so-called bulls. Uh, and from thence, it became more and more popular with the um, Italian bourgeoisie, and then, of course, the, it was picked up by the by uh, Arrighi and the other calligraphers. Who out of work because they couldn't uh, they couldn't write books anymore. They became instructors and made their manuals. They they worked collaborated with um, woodcutters to make prints printed books, printed calligraphy manuals. And then of course later on it was far easier and quicker to do it with um, engraving copper plates. Right. I'm gonna leave. Um, we mentioned. Uh... It, yeah, before we launched the 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 the, the webinar live, we, we you and I kind of talked a little bit about like other resources, and and I mentioned that we would we would add them um, in in the chat. So I'm going to post uh, two really good references that uh, oh, yeah. James asked us to to publish. I put in the uh, manifesto, but I also wanted to um, put put um, you and Clayton's wonderful book. The link to that, so folks, uh, if you wanted to kind of read up a little bit more about really, really worthwhile. And then of course another book which is interesting, a much older book. When, uh, was this one uh, the story, story, of writing. Writing, story of writing which as we said has also was also made into a video yeah so i linked i linked um to yeah, the that's video the other one that's the, the other link that i think is worthwhile that's a beautiful beautiful uh story uh done by done by jackson together with uh parker pens parker fountain pens mm -hmm. uh i think that was done first done <laughs> ooh, i don't know 1970s or 80s and uh, as I said to Sasha earlier, I showed that to so many generations of students that it just wore out. The VHS version just wore out. And uh, I didn't even know about the digital version until um, until Cara mentioned it this evening, just before yeah. I was uh, starting my talk. So, yeah. And uh, Jana um, just reminded me to 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 uh, add the monogram, like uh, to 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 give you a, uh, a little bit of time to talk about your your research and and what you're doing with monograms. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, I'm running a book on monograms. Uh, the provisional title is um, "Monograms from Ancient to Digital Times." So half of it will be uh, concerned with um, historical stuff we have there'll be uh greek coins uh and there will be um uh monograms in uh the byzantine monograms in in uh, santa sofia and and all kinds of things like that in, in things that are not widely known as well and then medieval monograms and then the renaissance uh, changes in the renaissance and how the monograms changed over the centuries and then we get up to i also do a part on architectural monograms 
from all over the world. They got stuff from Brazil. They got stuff from uh, from um, from Peru, from United States, from France, from Italy, from Hungary, etc., uh, uh, etc. Et uh, and then uh, the final part of the first half will be on Art Nouveau um, monograms. And then I move into contemporary monograms. So half of the book will be historical monograms. And the next half is, um, is to do with contemporary stuff right up to digital, uh, digital times. Yeah, and um, so, I'm, you know, it's taking up a lot of time. But, you know, that should, it should be ready quite soon by the end of the year. So there we are. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Looking forward to that. Um, I was I was able to get a sneak peek in like some of the early draft of of, of an article, or not 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 an early draft of the book, but certainly like a a, a note of, about the um, some of the research that you did. And and I forget the name of the publication that this was in. Like, ah, the uh, forum, Letter Exchange Forum. Letter Exchange Forum. That's right. Yeah, it's yeah. really really great. So look out for that, folks. Um, James, thank you so much for for your generosity with with your with your time and insight. And and uh, if folks wanted to watch this again, keep an eye out on the Cooper Union's YouTube channel. Certainly, we'll keep an eye out on on this. So it's a pleasure to have you back, James. And uh, you. like another a great great talk goes into our wonderful collection, wonderful archive. Wishing everyone a happy holidays. Uh, we have a lot of holidays coming up. Hopefully, it's it's peaceful, it's quiet, lots of health, everyone. And um, certainly hoping for the uh, the awful uh, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine that will come to to an end sometime soon. Hope hope for, for that uh, peace can come to another part of the of the world. So thanks everyone. Be safe. Be healthy. Thank you, James, again a million times. Uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Bye. 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 Okay. okay.